All right, I think I'm going to start. Should we close the door or that's okay? I mean, I don't, I don't hear any noise. So. They'll join. All right. So, uh, yeah, as I was saying, I, I um, it's my best, my first business trip in two years. I've been doing a lot of presentations uh, during this uh, two years, and uh, I was trying to count last night. I, I, I think I have probably delivered about fifty Zoom WebEx presentations in these two years, but it's been two years without doing it live in person or in an office. So just happy to be here, really happy that you're here to, to watch this. And I, I, I prepare something that I, I think is gonna be interesting. Uh, if you were here, I didn't recognize some of you, but if you were here on the session before this one, 11 at 11, they talk about the risks on open source and, and some of you know, how you, if you go for projects on the foundations, you know, there's to lower the risks because there's a governance and there's more. And this is a nice, nice segue because I'm going to talk about risks, but I'm talking about I'm going to talk about this from the support perspective and what do we mean with open source support, long-term support, end of life. I'll give you some examples of that. Uh, so hopefully we you, you'll, you'll learn something from from this and uh, and and you know for the next half an hour you'll you'll hear more about uh, or you'll learn something about this, right? I even going to use my little clicker here. Huh? It works. Yes. <laughs> um, my background, it's uh, always in software, uh, so sales engineer, solution architect, and product management. I, for the last couple of years, more dedicated to uh, advocacy, open source advocate, uh, chief evangelist with Perforce, uh, represent a brand that we call Open Logic. That what we do is we provide technical support, enterprise technical support for open source packages, open source software. And, uh, you know, Happy to talk more about that later. We have only a virtual tour, a virtual booth here. Uh, so you can you can see all my contact details. Happy to engage in more conversations with, with you. So we've been talking about open source for the last couple of days, and I haven't seen a slide like this to promote more of what we're doing in open source. See how many packages do we have out there? Like if you work with uh, Node.js, JavaScript, more than 1.7 million packages on NPM, right? And I'm not gonna talk about risks right now, but it's just how many, how many packages do, are out there, right? And the same if you are programming in Java or PHP or Python, look at the numbers. And I'm more impressed with the numbers uh, below, which is how many packages per day, new packages per day. It's amazing. I mean, obviously this is global, right? People from all over the world contributing and or just making their libraries available for, for everyone. Actually, I have the source. Actually, it's lost at the bottom of the screen. But the source for this, you can go and check. It's uh, mobilecount.com, and I check this this is slide uh, from time to time, and obviously keeps growing, keeps keeps growing. And in terms of the the Linux foundations, uh, obviously, as you know, when an open source project makes it, you know, start getting traction, more users, more contributors. You know, and a good path is to be part of one of these foundations because then you get more governments, you, you can get more budget, you get more contributors, more visibility. Uh, so these numbers, you know, more than 600 and all the Linux Foundation umbrella, right? That, that includes the uh, Continuous Delivery Foundation and Cloud Native Foundation and Open Mainframe Foundation and so many others. More than 600 projects, Apache, more than 270 projects. Like these are the good ones, right? Or, sorry, have to step back. Not the good ones, the popular ones. Right? <laughs> these are the popular ones. These are the ones that for the most part, if you decide to use any of the open source projects for, for your initiatives, you are gonna be okay because there's gonna be a commitment by the community to have a support, long-term support on those projects. And that's what I'm gonna be talking about for the next few minutes. So there's, there's, there are more guarantees, there's less risk. As I was saying on the previous session, they talk about the risks. And th there's, you know, if you are working for an important organization or you're basically building a, a very important app, a mission critical app, well, you have to be careful with what you use, right? <laughs> Most you're gonna be using open source, right? In some cases, maybe 90% of your applications are gonna be based on open source libraries, open source packages. Well, that's a, that's a, you lower your risk if you go up with some of these popular open source projects, right? Without without uh, endorsing anyone here, 
but the key piece is that they have a long-term support. There's a long, there's, there's a, there's a time where you know that the major releases are going to be supported. Uh, so don't have to tell you what this, right? You know, everyone knows here what an open source project is. There are some commonalities, same things, right? Obviously the code is open there. There's a documentation that you have to have on your open source project. But what about the release life cycle, right? That's not gonna be the same. And it applies for open source and it applies for closed source, right? Commercial software. The release cycles are gonna be very, very different. Uh, so I have a few examples for you. Huh, there's actually some gray arrows that, don't, that didn't make the screen there. <laughs> so there are arrows there that pointing to the right. And just didn't know that, just notice this. So there are arrows where you see the numbers, there are arrows. <laughs> uh, four examples. And I specifically looked at for these examples because they're, they are different, right? Obviously very successful open source projects the Linux kernel, right, since 1991. By the way, we're in 2021, so it's been 30 years. Back in just a few weeks ago, August, was the, basically the 30 year anniversary where Linus Torvalds sent that email saying, look at look what I'm doing here, right? <laughs> um, so it's been 30 years, 30 years, and they're in version five, <laughs> right? It, more or less, Every five, six years, there's a new major release. And, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more details. Node.js, much more recent, 2009. Some of you might remember in 2014 that fork, the community wasn't happy. Joint, this company in San Diego was basically the stewardship. They're, they're basically managing the, the project. Uh, they didn't wanna go so that fast, right? Because they were using Node.js for their enterprise applications. Uh, and there were some other disputes there and they decided to fork, right? Not a good thing. I, I was actually in, uh, working for a company that all our development was on Node.js and we were like, oh, what are we gonna do now, <laughs> right? Do we go with the fork, we we to stay? What do we do that? Uh, thankfully, you know, they talked to each other. They basically got into the OpenJS Foundation and then kind of merged again a year, less than a year later, right? And And now, they moved so much faster and we're now on version six, major version 16. Spark, much more recently, obviously very, very successful. Has be, uh, Apache Spark has become really, really successful, especially for all those AI machine learning initiatives. Uh, they're only, on, they're only on, you know, compared with Node.js, they're only on version three right now, major version three right now. And then Kubernetes, 2015. Right, hard to believe it's only six years. It's only six years old Kubernetes, <laughs> hard to believe and they're not even moving to major version two, right? So my point here is every, every uh, open source project has their own life cycle. And by the way, they change their cycles as they become more successful, as, as they get more contributions, right? So let me give you a little bit more details into that. Uh, this, this graph is available on, uh, on Wikipedia. Uh, they do a really good job on, on keeping track of all the different releases. What you see in color are the releases, right? Major release one, version one, version two, and then version three, different colors. What you see in gray before the color, that's the development time of development. And then in gray after the color is the time that they're gonna continue to support that release. So the long-term support. And when I said long-term support, I mean, they're gonna keep updating those releases, right? Fixes, bug fixes, uh, addressing vulnerability fixes. A um, couple of things just to highlight here, between six and 10 years life cycle, right? If you see the dates, that's the nice thing about Linux. It's been supported for not only Linux kernel, but all the, also the distributions. They've been supported for about 10 years, which is good. Good for the enterprise. And that has been a key for the success of Linux that enterprise adopt this because there's a long-term support, right? If they would have been just like a, uh, you know, a year, probably would still stay with Unix or Windows or who knows, right? But I wanna talk about Node.js, which is also used in the enterprise and the life cycle is much shorter, right? It's more or less around two major releases per year, right? Their long-term support is it's just about two years, about 30 months. And they only apply or they only provide long-term support for the even releases, meaning, um, uh, 
just like version 12, version 14, version 16, those are the ones that are gonna keep long-term support. If you're in, in an odd version, you're not getting the long-term support, right? So you have to pay attention to those things. If you are developing, if you organization is using it, you have to keep attention to those, those versions. And again, every community, open source community, it's different. So very, very important to keep an eye on, on those things. Spark, very different. Spark, uh, donated in 2013. Uh, they have about three, four releases per year, right? That's quarterly, right? That's very quick. Um, they, la they, they only apply long-term support, which is more standard to the last minor version, right? So the last on the major version one, the last one was 1.6, they apply long-term support 1.6. The last on the version two is 2.4, so they apply long-term support for uh, 2.4. Uh, and now they are on, on 3.x, on 3.1. Now, talking about risks, uh, Apache Spark is pretty much driven by Databricks. The, the, the inventor, the, the forgot now the name, the person that created the uh, Matei Saharia that it started Spark from Berkeley University and then donated to Apache, he actually founded Databricks, right? So the company is pretty much driving this community or this open source project. There are many contributors, but as you well know, when there's one company that is driving the, the project, there's, you know, they can make the decisions they want, right? Google does that a lot. And I have another example for you, CentOS, right? And I'll show you, I'll talk to you about, about CentOS for in just a second, but you know, is there a BRICS influence? Absolutely. There's no question about that, right? And then obviously Kubernetes. Kubernetes basically, I wouldn't consider long-term support. They're moving so fast, right? And again, Kubernetes has been deployed across all verticals in all industries. So what I said at the beginning that uh, Linux, you know, Linux has been successful because it had long-term supports of 10 years. That's why enterprises have been adopting Linux. Well, what about Kubernetes, <laughs> right? People are actually, or enterprises are adopting Kubernetes and they're moving in 15 weeks, uh, more or less 15 week release cycles. Uh, that's, that's a lot, right? And they're, they're basically, you know, for example, on version 1.19, they provided 12 month support and then two more months of updates. So, you know, that's not really long-term support, right? <laughs> but you have to keep moving, right? Because why? You've seen the, the uh, supply chain attacks, you know, the updates. I, I actually, after watching, I think we had like two or three sessions so far on supply chain. So I decided to add another slide there at the end, just to, just to add to the, <laughs> to the discussion. So I'll talk about that at the end. But my point here is, you know, you have to be aware of all these things. You have to be aware of when is at the end of the long-term support is when we call it end of life, right? End of life meaning no more updates to that version, my major minor version. Uh, you know, these are the challenges. Why the release life cycles are getting smaller and smaller because of this, right? And you see it with any other application development nowadays. I mean, obviously it's great to automate, it's great to, to keep moving fast, to not roll back, but to roll forward, right? To go fix it, next deploy, keep moving. So if you have to go back and support older versions, that's an issue and that takes resources and that takes a lot of time, right? I mean, it's just logical. So these are the issues, right? Uh, you know, you also, as you had more co more contributors, you have to merge all that code. You have to review all those commits. On the keynote uh, from Google, they were talking about, uh, I don't know if you, you watched it uh, with the questions, you know, you have to have someone else reviewing those commits, right? Not just the same person and things like that. So, I mean, they're, that's the reality. That, that's, that's open source support for you today. Um, Another factor, by the way, which people forget is open source projects. You want a successful open source project. You want that project available in all platforms. You know? And not all platforms are x86, right? You might want it also on an ARM processor, ARM32, ARM64, right? Or you might want it in some other platforms like S390X or, or others. If you don't know what S390X, that's the platform for IBM Z, the mainframes. Uh, and, and other platforms. So this is one example in this table uh, that this open source project, you see if you can guess this, the open source project, 
they're supporting across all these Linux distributions and for these processor architectures. Any guess? I mean, it could be anything, right? But I mean, you see there's a good number of supported, there's a good variety, right? Which means it's a large project with a lot of contributors. Yeah, probably a company really sponsoring that community. Any guess? .NET. <laughs> this is .NET 5, open source. It's been open source now for a few years, .NET. Last version I was, um, uh, well, I, was I used to work for IBM. I used to work for Red Hat. I used to work for a few places. We used to work closely with uh, Microsoft about .NET, and it's all open source. But yes, Microsoft is kind of driving that community, but there are a lot of contributors. And they have to go and support all these different Linux distributions and these different platforms. So it becomes more complex, right? So that explains why you need shorter life cycles, shorter uh, long-term supports. Uh, and that's the trend, right? So smaller releases, obviously do your automated testing, obviously do try to do your security testing, your scans, uh, uh, and yeah, in support less releases, like very important to backport patches, right? And, and if you have to support it for years, that takes a lot of effort. Uh, that takes a, definitely a lot of effort in going backporting patches and time consuming, right? So here are some not worth it end of life software. And if you were not aware of this, well, now you know, <laughs> no skills, now you know, I'm telling you. Uh, but there's so many, right? You have to keep an eye. So look at these examples. Angular, Angular has been around for some time. Angular 1, which is called the Angular JS, it's finally end of life at the end of this year. And then December 31st, right? It's been around for 12 years. There was actually an extension of six months because of COVID. 12 years has been around, hard to believe. I, I remember when it started, right? Hard to believe. Well, if you have applications on AngularJS, Angular 1, version 1, uh, you're not gonna have any more fixes, any more you know, vulnerability fixes, patches, things like that, right? So keep an eye. Python version 2, it's also going end of life. Actually, already went end of life after 10 years. Uh, Oracle Java on March 2022, after eight years. Drupal, Drupal, WordPress, um, missing a couple of other uh, content management solutions. They are known because they have a ton of vulnerabilities, <laughs> a ton of PHP vulnerabilities, right? So important, November 2022, there are not going to be any more updates. That's end of life, no more updates to Drupal 7. Right. And then uh, CentOS, CentOS, uh, interesting story, right? If you were not aware, I'll, sh I'll tell you a little bit about the CentOS story. End of life, it's also at the end of this year. CentOS 8, and that's the last CentOS. Why? Uh, miss again my arrows for some reason. There's it's an arrow over there. <laughs> um, you know, CentOS, very popular Linux distribution. Probably after Ubuntu, depending where you, what source you use, probably after Ubuntu is probably the mo second most successful or more popular uh, open source, completely open source Linux distribution, right? I'm not counting the Red Hat Enterprise Linux or uh, you know uh, Ubuntu Enterprise or SUSE or Enterprise that they grew a lot. There are commercial versions, right? But open source, open source that you download for free. Probably CentOS after Ubuntu, probably the, the second most popular. And uh, we had the story where in 2014, uh, Red Hat pretty much took ownership of that, that open source uh, project, right? Uh, in fact, they hired some of the contributors, engineers, and there's a board, there's this, uh, has all the governance like any other open source project, but it's pretty much driven by Red Hat, right? That's a reality. And that, by the way, that's a reality on many of the popular open source projects today. That's why it's also good if they're coming from a foundation because the, found, the foundations make sure that there's a there's diversity, right? Or there's there's there are multiple uh, companies part of the part of those projects. So uh, since 2014, it was it's been pretty much Red Hat resources. I mean, money and and full time upstream developers, Red Hat employees working on CentOS. And what they did is basically a copy of uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and and you know just just remove the you know, some of the branding, some of the artwork. And for the most part, not 100%, not but for the most part, pretty much the same packages, right? 
until December 8, 2020, they made a big announcement. In parallel, the same day, the CentOS uh, community and, and Red Hat, this is just a small piece of their announcement of the blog post, basically saying, uh, we are going to CentOS stream, right? We're gonna focus our efforts on CentOS stream and uh, you know, Red Hat, we just notified CentOS the board and, and that's it, <laughs> right? That's okay. I haven't heard any complaints about CentOS stream. The complaint has been really that the long-term support was reduced by eight years for the last version of CentOS, major, major release to the end of this year. So basically they gave one, one year notice. Right, that cost, that was shock. That was shocking news. That, that created lots of controversy, a lot of people angry. I went and read some of the community, some of the, the posts, uh, a lot of good stuff there, <laughs> or a lot of commentary there, right? Um, but, but look, why? Why, why, would they, why would you do this? And, you know, CentOS Stream, as I said, for the most part, I haven't heard really any complaints. It's, uh, what, it's what it's called a rolling release, right? And really what Red Hat has been doing kind of behind uh, closed doors from Fedora and doing the fixes and the testing and all the work before they release. The idea is to do it now on, do it in the open with, uh, with a CentOS stream and then release Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So for the most part, and you can read through the bullet points, for the most part, I mean, it's just the proper way to do it. And by the way, Red Hat took, took uh, the opportunity also to apply some more uh, DevOps, modernizing some of their, uh, automating some of their processes and you know, do it, do it, do it better. So, so, so now we have CentOS Stream, which is different. It's not CentOS Linux, right? Although they come from the same same source. Uh, and I found that that this chart, this and the next chart, is easy to explain. And um, I'm just going to go really quick. I don't know. I, I know we don't we don't have a lot of time, but for the most part, as you as you can see, Fedora, you know, keeps going there. This is a place to experiment. You can put Fedora on your laptop and, you know, it's been around for a long time. Uh, it's good, but it's not where you put your, you know, production environments, right? Uh, Red Hat takes uh, downstream from Fedora, also applies their testing, the validation, the fixes. And then there was just a copy, basically removing the artwork for the most part for CentOS, right? And you can see on the chart, you know, the whole cycle of downloading, updating, you go upstream, your pull requests accept and, and so on. What happened now is uh, Red Hat, what Red Hat was doing more of behind the closed doors, now it's done on the open with CentOS Stream from Fedora, and then they release uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. So CentOS Stream a little bit ahead of the commercial version of Red Hat. That's a new CentOS Stream, right? So uh, just uh, uh, a recap on the long-term support. I mentioned uh, December 31st, uh, so at the end of this year, for CentOS 6 uh, already happened, November 2020, so it's end of life right now. They didn't change CentOS 7, by the way, so it stays the same. It was released in 2014, end of life, long -term, end of long-term support is 2024. So uh, I've seen customers already that they are moving back from CentOS 8 to CentOS 7, just for that reason. And because it's easier, the, the, the migration as opposed to go and migrate to, to, to another distribution. And, and then CentOS 8, which uh, also a lot of people were not happy because they spend a significant amount of more, uh, time and money migrating from CentOS 6 and 7 to 8, then just to find out that the long-term support was reduced <laughs> right, so so that's the that's the current situation there. Uh, what are the options? And just really quick, this this session is not about Linux, but um, you know you can go with CentOS Stream, try to go that way, or a commercial version with Red Red, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. You can go uh, migrate to some of the forks or copies of CentOS, which there are a few now, actually new ones, right? Uh, we always had the Linux, uh, Oracle Linux, which has been basically been a copy of, uh, of CentOS. Uh, there's a new one called Rocky Linux. There's a new one, Alma Linux, which actually is here. I don't know if you noticed the Alma Linux, which comes from uh, the, the, uh, the company Cloud Linux. So now they have like two distributions there. Alma Linux being the open source one. Um, 
So Rocky Linux, Alma Linux, Navy Linux, and they're gonna be more common, right? So ideally, you know, straight, ideally, straightforward migration, although you never know, right? If you're using a different package, you know, might break the application, you have to do your testing, you have to do your planning. Uh, migrate to other Linux distribution altogether, right? A little bit more challenging, but absolutely you can do it. I was just working, uh, talking to an engineer from, from our company, from Perforce, and he said, we just tested in Ubuntu, it all just works just fine, everything, perfect. It's like, good, <laughs> no more work. But you never know if you are using a, a package. By the way, you know how many packages do we have on, on any Linux distribution? We have tens of thousands. I mean, we have... Um, one has like more than 10,000. There's a, I think Ubuntu, which is, they are adding a lot of libraries for AI and machine learning. Uh, they have something like 30,000 packages, 30,000, right? So if you're using a package that is not in this distribution, but it's in this distribution, well, your application is gonna behave differently or, or just break or, or an API might just break or something, right? So you have to do your, your, your planning. And then the, the, the fourth option is uh, something that companies like uh, OpenLogic by Perforce we are offering basically support to extend your, your uh, long-term support, basically taking care of the patching and, and, and prof professional technical support, just like other companies. Um, so, I mean, I don't think, I, I think this, this slide is extra, right? I think you all agree with this. Uh, you know, it, it's really, really important. I mentioned that the fact that, that we had long-term support, it, it basically meant that, uh, uh, enterprises kind of adopted the open source, although has things ha ha are changing with Spark and with Kubernetes and, and others. Uh, but it's very important now security, right? With this, I, I guarantee you that next year we're gonna have even more sessions about security here, right? We already have a few more. And, and it's all about, you know, the critical box and the addressing vulnerabilities. And, you know, there's another issue about, you know, reporting, disclosing vulnerabilities. And I know companies like Sonatype are doing a lot of efforts on those things. and. Uh, that, that's another topic, but bottom line is you have to keep up with the latest versions, right? And you need to know when, when there's the end of uh, long-term support, end of life. And of course, uh, if you ignore the end of life, you are at risk and you are at major security risks, right? You're gambling <laughs> and, and you don't want to lose, lose your job because of that, right? Um, um, yes, it's, it's becoming more, much more complex if you stay on an uh, end-of-life version. You say, well, I'm not going to touch it. My application is not going to change. I don't have to do anything. Well, no, guess what? Everything else keeps moving, right? All those dependencies are now different than you, even your performance or even if you have an integration with something else, they're going to say, we don't support that version anymore. So it, it adds, it, it becomes more and more complex. Uh, so I have... To Two examples, so three examples for you, uh, just because I want to scare you. <laughs> I want the audience to, to keep an eye on the end of life software, right? I think most people remember this WannaCry, right? And this actually technically is not open source here, the situation, because it was on Windows, right? But the point here, it was on Windows version, uh, a, a version that it was end of life, that had not received pa pa uh, updates, patches, in, in, in months, right? So they took advantage when I cried, went and basically installed ransomware and affected more than 200,000 computers all over the world, right? To the point that uh, I, uh, Microsoft had to do what no one does, which is went back to end of life version and patched the end of life version and made it available to everyone. That's how big it, the issue was, right? With when I cried and you know, since then, now ransomware is becoming much, much popular, but at least people are aware that these this things like this happens, and all because of an end-of-life software, right? Another one, do you remember Panama Papers? Well, there's a new one now, right? The, the Pandora Papers, uh, that just happened uh, three weeks ago, maybe? There's a new one, which is much bigger. The point I wanna make here, and, and of course it was leaked, uh, you know, it affected all over the world, and. I think only one person got arrested after all that, which is crazy, but <laughs> it's crazy, but, but, but a big deal, right? Big, big deal. They got in via WordPress end of life and Drupal end of life. That's how they got in. 
right? Now, maybe you can argue, well, that was a good cause, whatever, but <laughs> end of life, <laughs> end of life software, that's how they got, they, they got the data, right? Uh, and I don't have, we don't have any information about Panama Papers yet in terms of how they uh, got that information, or if it was just simple leak, you know, copy and give you the files, uh, nobody knows, at least not, not yet, but it's, it's a bigger deal. Uh, and then your news, right? Uh, I'm just going to kind of highlight some of these. Magneto, which is for e-commerce, very, very popular. More than 2,000 stores got affect, uh, hacked on, for an end-of-life version. Uh, Cisco, it's, it basically they said, we're not updating end-of-life <laughs> um, version of uh, the VPN. Um, Sonic Wall, also with an, uh, a hack on, uh, exploit on an end-of-life uh, um, a firewall. So, you know, very, very important. When we talk about security, but most of the vulnerabilities, uh, they have a fix, right? Because people disclose the vulnerability. For the most part, the intelligent way to do it is to disclose a vulnerability when you have the fix, right? So for the most part, all these open source vulnerabilities, they already have a fix, but you have to keep up with the with the releases, you have to keep up with the versions. So here's an example, and this is, I was telling you that this is the, the slide that I added just because I wanted to, to be part of this. Uh, you know, just a very simple example of one library that depends of, it has other dependencies, right? So it uses other libraries, and then they use other libraries. So this is a very simple example. This is a very simple example, but a, a real example, maybe on OJS or on Python, may look like this, which is, hundreds to hundreds or maybe thousands of many to many dependencies uh, on those libraries. And those will have vulnerabilities and there might be some exploits for those vulnerabilities. Now, obviously, I mean, there are hundreds, maybe, no, there are thousands of vulnerabilities out there. Some of them are really minor, low score, uh, CVSS score. Some of them might be high or critical. Even in critical, they may not have an exploit or at least not known exploit yet. But there are others that they do, and, and you want to you want to take that risk, right? So again, the importance of the long-term support by the communities, by the organizations that are sponsoring or contributing to those communities, and for everyone else to keep an eye on those end-of-life uh, uh, cycles, right? So yeah, every time there's new code, there's a possibility for new vulnerability, you know. Go to GitHub, how many updates, how many commits are there, pull requests out there, they're happening just all the time, right? Things that you pull from NPM or from PyPy, you know, the library, the next time you pull it, it's already updated. It's different. So there's always the risk with new code. As I mentioned, uh, there were different reports, but more or less around 95% of the vulnerabilities already have a fix. Just, you just have to keep up with, right? So the issue is, it's a speed here. <laughs> Um, you have to keep up with the latest releases. So just to just to finish the, the, the session here, um, I, I think it's very important to keep an eye on all these things that I just mentioned. I, I think um, you know it's, open source is great, much better than, than using closed source because we don't know what's happening in the closed source environment. Uh, but you have to, it's very, very important that support, support at the, at the release level and then community level, right? The contributors and people that are fixing and, and doing the you know good good work there. And then if you need professional support uh, to maintain some of your mission critical or important applications out there, which are based for the most part on open source software. So you know very, very important to keep an eye on, on long-term support of release support, but then also you know who's supporting you, what type of risks you take when you use different open source. Um, Long-term support and, and, and end of life uh, open source software are really critical factors and for the functionality. So with that, thank you very much. Uh, I was told that if you go to our virtual booth, you can sign up for a $200 uh, uh, Amazon gift card. Uh, I'm told that we haven't given away, so, so there's a, still a chance to win that one. <laughs> and uh, here again, my, my contact details, happy to engage in conversation. Thanks.